Deuteronomy chapter 8, we've been preaching about faith. Uh, first week we talked about what faith is. And remember I brought up a, a car title. Because uh, the Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is. Now, now, right now, it's right now. It's not yesterday, it's not tomorrow, it's right now. I believe God right now. I believe God, like Paul said, that it'll be even as he told me. Hadn't happened yet was going to happen, but he said, I believe God, it's going to happen just the way it happened. That's faith. Faith is now. What you're believing for may not be now, but faith that says you have it now is now. Does that make sense? Too many nows in there, right? And so it'd be like I said, if someone uh, bought me a new vehicle, but they're having it all spruced up for me, and I told people, man, I got a brand new car, and they say, where is it? I go, well, you can't see it because it's down at the shop getting some stuff put on it, but here's the title deed. It's the title deed. This proves that it's mine. And you would look at that and you would say, and a court of law would say, that's right, that's your vehicle. You have the title deed. Amen. Well, I'm believing God for something. I'm believing God for my healing. I'm believing God for uh, some type of prosperity. I'm believing God for whatever it is I'm believing God for. Well, well can you see it? No. I, how do you know you have it? This is my title deed. This is the promise. This is it. This is faith is the substance. Now faith is the substance. And it's faith in who he is and what he said, not just in what he said, but who he is. And then the second week we talked about the, the guy with the, what, that faith is active. Faith requires corresponding action. You, you can't just sit and say you have faith. The devils have faith. They believe in Jesus. They're not saved. I mean, you read that in James. So that's why I love the book of James. 
James says, hey, you say you have faith. Show me your faith without your corresponding actions. Show me your faith without it. He says, I'll show you I have faith by, the, by my corresponding actions. And so there's a guy with a tightrope across Niagara Falls and he wheels this wheelbarrow of 200 pounds sand across and he takes it out and he says, now who believes that I can wheel a human person across in this wheelbarrow? And they're like, yeah, we believe. He says, get in the wheelbarrow. Faith gets in the wheelbarrow. Faith doesn't just sit and say, yeah, I believe that's true. Meanwhile, you do nothing. So that was uh, last week. This week, this is going to be good. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Then we're going to get into this uh, hopefully right away. Here's a question I want to ask you. And don't answer out loud. Just answer to yourself. And some of you, you'll answer to the positive right away because you've known by experience what faith is. You've known by experience the goodness of God. So here's question one. Do you believe? And like I say, don't answer out loud, but be honest with yourself because some struggle with this. That God desires, not just, I, I was going to use the word want. I got, no, it's not a good word. That God desires. You ever had a desire for something? You ever come in out a hot, hot day and you had a desire for a drink of water? You ever had a desire for something? Do you believe that God desires, hear this, to bless and prosper you? Do you believe that? Well, pastor, I ain't worthy of it. N none of us are except in Christ. In Christ, he wants to, he desires to prosper me and to bless me. Pastor, you one of those prosperity preachers? Yes. The good kind, the right kind. God wants to prosper me so that I in turn may prosper others. God wants to bless me so that I could be a blessing. Amen. Now, second question. Do you believe that God has established spiritual principles? Even as way back in Genesis. Spiritual principles and spiritual laws for the purpose of blessing and prospering you so you could be a blessing. Do you believe that? I believe that. I believe that God has established certain principles, certain laws, even as far back as Genesis, that carry on today and show the, these are avenues in order for God to give us avenues of blessing and prospering that we need to engage in if we want to be blessed and prosperous. And I'm talking about mostly material. Oh, yeah. See, there's already the pushback, Andrew. There's already the pushback. Because let me, let me tell you, he's going to preach about money. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I am. You know it. Because this right here, that's the last thing to get sanctified and saved in your life. The next thing is sex. But you'll put money above sex. Who'd, me, who'd rather me preach on money or preach on sex? Let's take a poll. Okay. I'm going to preach on money. Because the Bible, say, the Bible doesn't say the love of sex is the root of all evil. The Bible says the love of money. And, and listen, you don't have to be rich to have the love of money. There are poor people, can't rub two nickels together. They have the sin of the love of money. You know, it's, it, this, this time of year we are in Thanksgiving and we're in the giving and we're in the receiving. Isn't that right? So why not? I want to talk about faith in prosperity. Oh, it's quiet in this. It's just going to get worse. Amen. Do you, does God desire to bless and prosper? Yes, Pastor Mikey does. Yeah, God's a good God. God wants to bless me. Do you believe God set up spiritual principles and laws by which uh, for you to participate in so he can bless you? No, I just want him to bless me without that. God don't need it. God doesn't need your piddly little $20.
Hello. So when we give our tithe, when we give our offering, let's not act like, oh, <laughs> he needs me. <laughs> he don't need it. But he needs your heart. If he's got your heart, he's got everything. And everything you have, you have received from him. Everything, including your money. Deuteronomy chapter 8, I love this. Oh man, I could preach this for six months. But let me bring up a scripture before we get there. You ready? Here it comes on the screen. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. The good news is, though, if you're saved, you say, Pastor, I'm a Christian. Jesus Christ, the Lord of my life. Guess what? You have faith. Now, what are you going to do with it? You have faith. What are you going to do with it? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, obviously, and also that he is a rewarder. God delights in being a rewarder of those who diligently, someone say diligently, seek him. Now, God's not lost. So it's not like, oh, I wonder where God is. Another word there would be them that diligently search him. What am I searching, pastor? I'm searching God's will, plan, and purpose for my life. I'm searching God's will, plan, and purpose in my relationships. I'm searching God's will, plan, and purpose in raising my children. Come on, well, I'm searching God's will, plan, and purpose in, in how to love my spouse. I'm searching God's will, plan, and purpose in my finances. I'm searching God's will, plan and purpose in my relationships. I'm searching God's will, plan and purpose on how I should be as an employee, on how I should be as an employer. They that diligently seek him. What am I seeking? I'm seeking his kingdom for my life. Why? Because I'm a Christian. Because that's what Christians do. Don't we? We're Christians. We're not Christians in name only. We're not Christians in Facebook only. We're Christians. It means we're followers of Jesus. That means we want to do what he says is right to do. That's right. And if he says something's wrong, we don't want to do that. And if he says something's right, we want to do it and a whole lot of it. That's what Christians do. Do we fail? Oh, of course we do. Why do we fail? Because we get selfish. All sin is selfish. You never sin for someone else. You sin for yourself. Well, pastor, I drove the getaway car for the guys that rock. Ah, you did it for yourself. Whoo, I love this. It's so quiet in here. I could sleep. Uh, we're going to read out of Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is after 40 years of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness because God had to kill off all those doubters 40 years before who when the 12 spies came back and said, let, and Joshua and Caleb said, let us go up at once and possess the land. The other 10 said, no, we can't do it. There are giants there. I love listening to Francis Chan when he says, it's like people, you know, and they, they sign up to be a Christian and not realizing, like Jesus said, count the cost. And hey, here's what's demanded of you. Hello. Demanded of you, but he gives you the power and the nature to do what he demands. Can you say Amen. So it ain't like he says, you know, I'm going to leave you just like you are and you try to, no, no, no. He changes you. So he gives you his nature. Can you say amen? amen? And so then when he tells you to do something because you're born again, yeah, you want to do it. Your flesh will fight it, but you want to do it, but you overcome. Hello. You, ain't, don't, get, you don't save the flesh. Flesh will never get saved. Never. Just look at your flesh and say, you'll never be saved. Never. It never will. But it'll fight you. It'll fight you. But by the power of the Holy Ghost, you tell the flesh, no, only two Krispy Kremes, not four. <laughs> you show that flesh who's boss right there, man. It's 
Somebody say, move off of that real quick. Don't worry, I will. Size 30 jeans, amen. <laughs> so I, when I read Deuteronomy 8, I, they're gonna go in from 40 years in the wilderness to the promised land, delivered out of Egypt. When I read it, I like to think about my spiritual life. Okay, that God has delivered me out of Egypt, out of the world, and now he's brought me into the kingdom of his dear son, and he's brought me there, not just, not just to bring me in and that's it. No, no, he wants me to possess the land. He wants me to go after what he has promised me as a believer. He wants me to, Jesus said, occupy until he come. He wants me to continue to gain ground in my witnessing, in my loving, in my forgiving, in, in, in my finances, in my relationships. He wants me to continue to gain ground. Amen. I'm starting to get that raspy preacher voice. I think sexy. <laughs> but my wife could care less. Amen. She's like, go get a drink of water. <laughs> That's what I live with. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's read this. Okay, verse one. All the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do. Thank you. All the commandments. How many know we have commandments in the New Testament that's above and beyond, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. There are other commandments from Jesus in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, Jesus said, he that, he that keeps my commandments, he it is who loves me. Now, I met lots of Christians. They say they love Jesus, but they don't even want to keep his commandments. Had a girl once, uh, if I'd say her name, some Andrew and Joanne would know who I'm talking about, but I won't. Uh, she got saved at like 10, 11 years old. Uh, when she got to be a teenager, she got into uh, drugs and alcohol and prostitution. Finally, uh, in her, I think, late teens, early 20s, Jesus delivered her out of that. And so she's given me her testimony. I praise God. She's given me her testimony. She goes, but you know, Pastor Mike, all the while I was doing that, I, I loved Jesus. I said, no, you didn't. Oh, yeah, I did. I did. I love Jesus. I said, no, you didn't. I said, maybe you liked the idea of Jesus. Maybe you respected him mentally. I said, you didn't love Jesus. If you'd have loved Jesus, you'd have been keeping his commands. So don't lie to yourself and say, but through it all. No, through it all, he loved you. Through it all, he was seeking you. Through it all, he was drawing you. Through it all, he's going after you. No mountain too high, right? No wall too big. He won't break down coming after you, but don't sit there and lie and say you loved him. You didn't, that'd be like me committing adultery against my wife two, three times a week and going, oh, but I love her. You'd be like, Pastor Mike, you're an idiot. You don't love her. If you loved her, you'd honor her. That's why we have those honor Jesus bracelets. So don't be lying to yourself. He that keepeth my commandments, Jesus said, he it is who loveth me. The commandments are not a requirement for salvation. They're proof of salvation. Boy, you ought to tweet that. And so here, all the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do. Now watch this. That you may live, that you may, this is the goodness of God. I want you to live. I want you to multiply. I want you to go in. I want you to possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. God said, I want good for you. We like to quote Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans of good and not of evil to give you an expected end. Yeah. And that's true. I like that too. But God says, hey, you want to enjoy what I have for you? Keep my commandments. It's just like that. How many of you have a driver's license. Some of you don't need one, but how many of you have one? See, some of you shouldn't have one, but how many have one? Amen. Yeah. How many of you like to drive? I don't mean long, just, just like, you like driving. You know, I remember when I first learned to drive, I love driving. I couldn't wait to get my driver's license. Oh, I love driving. And I do. Today, I, I still like driving short distances. <laughs> like here at the grocery store. Amen. You know, short distances. I just rode eight and a half hours in the back seat of a Honda. Saturday that was a test of my salvation 
So you get your driver's license, and you're like, man, this is great. And then all of a sudden, well, why'd the government put that yellow line down there? Don't they know I like to drive all over the road? Why, why'd the government put these speed limits? Don't they know I like to go fast? Why'd the government have all these regulations? Well, let me tell you why they don't have it. Uh, they didn't put those up. Or excuse me, how do I put this? Those are not there to take away your joy of driving. Those are there so you can enjoy your privilege of having a driver's license so you can be safe and so that everybody else on the road can be safe. Amen? Same way with God. Why does God put the yellow line of morality in your life? He's not trying to take away your fun of sin. He's not trying to take away, be a killjoy. No, he puts that line and those rules and those regulations so you can enjoy life to protect you and to protect everybody else you come in contact with. Amen? Now, if you find, if you say, well, I'm a Christian, but I find the commands of God to be grievous, you need to check and see if you're really a Christian. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to wrestle with some stuff because you have flesh. And, and the flesh wants to do what the flesh wants to do. Amen? But when you're born again, there's that constant battle of your born again spirit battling that. And the more closer you get to Jesus and the more full of Jesus and his word you get, the stronger you'll be till that flesh. Forget it. I told you two Krispy Kremes. Just helping anybody. Right now you're smiling. Good. Keep that in the next few minutes. So here he goes. He goes, I want you to keep my commandments that you may live. Living's good. I'm for living. That you may multiply. That's good. I like things multiplying in my life. Not just children. I like blessings multiplying. I like all kinds of things that I can go in and, and, and not just sit, but actually possess the land. And you shall remember. Devin, remember when you were single? That Devin back there, yeah. Remember when you were a single brother? Remember when you got engaged? Remember when you got married? Remember when you had that first child? Devin and Kaylee, remember that. What wonderful blessings. You remember where God brought you from to where you're at today. Now, little Cooper. That's what God's saying. Remember how I led you in the wilderness. Remember, let's read it. He said, I want you to remember. You shall remember, that's a command, all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, and by humbling doesn't mean, look it up in the Amplified. By humbling, God doesn't mean, oh, I'm gonna humble you. No, it means to cause you to trust and depend on him. In the book of James, when it says, humble thyself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, that's saying, learn to trust and come under God's dependence. That's what it means to humble you, not like embarrassing you or uh, trashing you in front of your friends. It's a good thing. That he will humble you to prove you. Remember Julius was here? He talked about, don't fail the test of God how God will prove you. A faith that can't be tested is a faith that can't be trusted. And he will prove you also. Well, look at this. To know what was in your heart. Well, pastor, can God see what's in my heart? Yeah, he can see what's in your heart, but he wants you to know what's in your heart. One of the ways he knows what's in, what's in your heart, especially when it comes to money, is when God challenges you financially. And you draw back. Or you think of some people, well, I only give when there's a need. And that's why you're stingy. Because you don't yield to God's principles and laws of blessing and prospering. Because you don't see them as that. This is a tight subject for me because my wife and I have been givers for over 40 years. I've been tithers for over 35. I believe in it. 
I believe in the blessing of God. I believe in avenues and principles and statutes of God and laws that he's established. And through those, he brings blessing and prospering. And it's all done by faith. Pastor, why do you do that? By faith, I do it. I don't do it because out of duty. I don't do it out of compulsion. I do it out of faith. Uh, a few months ago, a friend of mine held a, uh, a banquet, a, uh, what do you call it, a fundraiser, fundraiser for something they want to do down in uh, Panama for orphan kids. And my wife and I went to it. And uh, so we're being challenged at the end. Thank God for challenges. We're being challenged at the end to give a financial contribution. And, you know, we could, we could like Jesus, watch the uh, people give. You know, one time it says in Luke, he sat over against the treasury and watched how people gave. And those that had many gave much. It'd be like Warren Buffett giving $1,000. Well, what's that to Warren Buffett? Nothing. I tell him, keep the thousand. I hope you're listening too. Anyway, but I ain't bitter. And it said, uh, uh, this widow woman came. And he knew he, she was a widow woman because he told his disciples, she's a widow woman. And he knew that's all she had left. Jesus knew that. She gave two mites. Now, why didn't he tell her, oh, hey, look, no, you're a widow woman. This is everything you got. Take this back out of here and go buy you a loaf of bread. No, he didn't do that. He let her give it. Why? Because she gave in faith. Don't you think Jesus knew she gave in faith? You think he knew everything else about her but didn't know that? Why didn't he rebuke her and say, no, woman, go pay your bills with that? There you go. So anyway, we give, uh, we're talking about what we should give. And, you know, we could give a certain amount, and it'd be all right. Uh, so we do the old right stuff down on a piece of paper, and they didn't match. It's one of the few times it didn't match. It's, but we agreed a certain amount, and it was, it, was, it was a step of faith for us. So we give that amount out of our personal account. And uh, within a week, within a week, out of the blue, people blessed us with a check. They didn't know anything about that. They're not even from this state. They're from out of state. They blessed us, us, not the church, us, with a check for $200 more than what we put in. Amen. So I believe, I believe in the principle of sowing and reaping by faith. By faith. Yikes. To prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Boy, that's a... Uh, people say, God, use me, God, use me. And then he tells them to do something that's difficult. Uh, I don't want to do that. God, use me somewhere else. Like I heard a preacher, he said, you better watch out what you pray for. We have people that say, God, use me, use me. And then next week, man, I, I just feel like I'm being used. You just feel like people walking all over me. <laughs> What's up with that? Do you believe God ever had issues with his people? Do you believe that today God has issues with his people? Has he ever had an issue with you? I wonder how many of those issues he's had with you regarding money. Boy, that put the brakes on. We ain't even started into this. Let's just read. Verse 3, And he humbled you and suffered you to hunger, and he fed you with manna. Now, what that means, hunger, doesn't mean they went hungry. It means they didn't get what they wanted. They wanted meat, and he gave them manna. But some of them kept crying after me. We want me, we want me, we want me, we want me, we want. You better watch what you ask God for. Because, you know, after a while, he'll just give it to you. He'll say, okay, it's not, I don't want you to have it. It's not good for you. 
but I'll take the restraint off and you can have it and watch what it does to you. You say, Pastor, he don't do that. <laughs> it's over and over in the Bible. He didn't tell Israel, he didn't want them to have a king. They wanted a king. He said, you get a king, here's what's gonna happen to you. We don't care, we want a king anyway. He said, all right, I'll give you a king. And exactly what he said would happen, happen. And read it in your Bible, read it in the book of Psalms where God, they wanted meat. We want meat, we want meat to eat, we want flesh to eat. And God said, okay, I'll give you flesh. And he sent them, he said, I'll give it to you till it runs out your nose. Yeah, that's the same God, same Jesus, hello. And so they got it, and then it said he killed the fattest of them while they still had the meat in their mouth. I know they ain't too popular. I ain't going to go on TBN right there. He humbled you. In other words, he caused you to depend on him, and he suffered you to hunger. He didn't give you what you wanted. He gave you what you needed. And he's doing that for a purpose. So when you do get in the land, he can promote you. God has his own boot camp. God has his own spiritual discipline and training so that he can promote you and reward you with the true riches. He will use material things a lot of times to prepare you to see if you can handle the true riches. And Jesus talked about that in his sermons. He said, if you can't handle that which is another man's, who will give you the true riches? That's good preaching, Pastor Mike. Thank you. And he fed you with manna, which you knew not, neither did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. Get your eyes off of your money. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, thy raiment did not wax old upon you, neither did your foot swell these 40 years. My foot swelled eight and a half hours in the car. Sitting in the car and all of a sudden my tennis shoes got tight. I told Cleo, I said, man, these shoes, I thought they were comfortable. She goes, your feet are swelling. Sitting too long. You young people know nothing about that. <laughs> it's coming. Oh, yeah, it's coming. See, he's like, you can believe for it, brother. Oh, I love it. You shall also consider, someone say consider. Consider this in your heart, that as a man disciplines, chastens his son in love, so the Lord your God disciplines and chastens you in love. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God. Now watch this. <coughs> How do I keep the commandments of the Lord? I walk in his ways. I fear him. For the Lord your God brings you, here's his heart, into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land wherein you shall eat bread without scarceness. That's the blessing of God towards you. That you may not lack anything in in the land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you may dig brass. God's a good God. God wants to bless you. God wants to prosper you. God wants you to go in the land and he wants you to eat the good of the land and multiply. Amen? Amen. And all this is done as when I enter the land, I keep his commandments. Why? So he can trust me. I want to obey those avenues and those, those statutes of blessing and prospering. Why? So he can bless me so I, in return, can be a blessing. Wesley, would you come, please? Are we, we on the same page there? But it's all done by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You have faith. What are you doing with it? Now, here comes the warnings. When you have eaten. Notice he didn't stop there. Look at the next three words. And are full. That's my God. When you have eaten and are full. He wants you to be satisfied. 
Then you shall bless the Lord your God for the land which he's given you because there's a tendency not to do that. There's a tendency that when you have eaten and you're full, there's a tendency to forget being thankful. There's a tendency to forget all of that. We're going to get into this in a second when we're done for today. Beware. Wait, wait. Bless the Lord your God for the good land. Jesus, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the shoes on my feet. Jesus, thank you for the clothes on my back. Jesus, thank you for a roof over my head. Thank you, Jesus, for food to eat, for money to put gas in my car and to pay my bills and money left over to bless. Jesus, thank you. When you have eaten and are full, beware lest you forget Beware that you forget not the Lord your God. Watch this. How do you forget God? Not keeping his commandments. Not keeping his judgments, which are principles. Not keeping his statutes, which I command you this day. Now, let me break the word principle down or judgment down for you. Judgment means principles. Principles are accepted rule of action or conduct. That when you serve Jesus Christ, he has accepted rules of conduct and action for your life. And if you have the living Jesus inside of you, you want to conform to those rules of action and conduct that he has established in his kingdom. Hello, are you listening to me? If you want to buck that all the time, check and see if you've really surrendered your life to Jesus. Maybe you only know him up here. Maybe he's really not sitting on the throne of your heart. I didn't say you ain't going to wrestle with some stuff. We already talked about that. Now, forget, let's keep reading. When you have, that was 11, let's go to 12. Lest when you have eaten and are full, I love it, he says it again. And you have built goodly houses and dwell therein. And when your herds and your flocks multiply, your silver and your gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. Beware that your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. We're going to stop there a second. How does this happen that we forget? Drop on down to verse 19. And it shall be, if you do it all, forget the Lord your God and walk after other gods. Who's the first God, little g, that you serve when you leave Christ? Yourself. The first God, little g, that you serve when you begin to drift from Jesus is yourself. Hold your finger here and go with me quick to... uh, 2 Thessalonians. We're going to come back. 2 Thessalonians in the New Testament, right by Timothy. One preacher said, you find one T, you find them all in the New Testament. Amen. They're all stuck together. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm not going to argue about, you know, Pastor Mike, do you believe in there's going to be a antichrist, one person, one guy, that's going to, or woman that's going to rise. I believe it's a man because the Bible says a man going to rise and, you know, and defy God. Yeah, probably. But did you know that John the apostle wrote in 1 John that right now there are many antichrists in the world? Many, many antichrists. Anti means against or false. There are many who are against Christ. There are many false Christ. The Pope is an antichrist. Yeah, he's a false Christ. There are many antichrists. Okay? So uh, let's not just, let's get our mind off of one person. So look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and look at verse 3. This is uh, Paul by the Holy Ghost writing about the apostasy that's going to happen in the last days. Now, what does that mean, apostasy? Apostasy are those who walked with Jesus but have turned their back on him. The apostasy of those who had the love of God in them, loved Jesus, but for whatever reason, like Demas, hath forsaken him for the love of this present world. 
That, and, and for those of you that believe in once saved, always saved, we have these people that go, well, no, Pastor Mike, if a guy walked with Jesus for 25 years and then he left following Christ and he went back to the world, he never was saved. Then there can be no apostasy. There can be no apostatizing if that's true. If the dude was never saved, he had nothing to apostatize from. Does that make sense? You can't have a falling away if you've never been. You can't apostatize if you've never grasped. And so Paul is speaking about the great apostasy. And he says, let no man deceive you by any means. That day, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's return shall not come except there come a falling away, an apostasy first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God, big G, sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Who is the temple of God today? We are. We're the temple of God. When we leave Jesus and we kick him off the throne of our heart, off of the, out of his temple, and we take his place, we become one of those antichrists. The first God that you serve when you leave Jesus is yourself. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, please. Verse 19. And it shall be, if you do it all, forget the Lord your God and walk after other gods and serve them. Who are you going to serve? You're going to serve yourself. And worship them. I testify you this day that you shall perish. To walk after other God means to walk after yourself. To serve means you conform. To worship means you give your time, your affection, your money to whatever God. I would love to finish this, man, because it finishes, ironically, on an upbeat. And right now we're at, oh, on a downbeat. But for lack of time, I got to finish and pick it up next week. Because in the end here, God says, hey, the reason I want you to do these things, and we've already read some of that. He says, because I want to bless you. I desire to bless you and prosper you and multiply you. I want you to possess the land. I just don't want you to go in and be a resident. I want you to take ownership. I want you to possess the land. I want to bless you that you might be a blessing. That's what I want you to hear. Faith in prosperity. It's all done by faith. I, I know God wants to prosper me. I know God wants to bless me. And he wants me to do it to be a blessing because guess what? I brought nothing into this world. And it's certain I can carry nothing out. And Andre, I'm only here for a little while. James said, like a puff of smoke. And so while I'm here, I want to honor Jesus. And I ain't going to wrestle with people that want to argue about giving and receiving. And, you know, go argue with devils on that. I don't have time. I know the goodness of my God. And I know his blessing. But I give and I receive by faith. That's right. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. I'm just going to make this quick. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I am not right with Jesus and I need to get right with him. And I would like prayer. I want to get right with Jesus. If that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, please stand. I want to pray with you right where you're at. If that's you, Pastor, I need to get right with Jesus. Please stand. Please stand. Anybody. Anybody, I'll wait five seconds. Pastor, I need to make my life right with Jesus. There's one. There's two. You fellas, close your eyes and put your face toward heaven and start talking to Jesus right now under your breath. Just tell Jesus that, Jesus, I come to you. And I ask you to forgive me. I, I turn from my sin and I turn to you, Jesus. Forgive me. Come into my life. Just tell him yourself. Tell him right now. Under your breath, because he's the only one who can save you. Anyone else? Pastor, I need to, Jesus Christ. There's two more in the back. Three more in the back. Pastor, I need Jesus in my life. Y'all lift your face towards heaven and begin to tell Jesus you want him in your life. You want him. You know how to talk to him. Just tell him your desire. Jesus, I want you. 
I turn from my sin and I want you, Jesus. Forgive me, come into my life. That's five people, anybody else? Pastor, I need Jesus in my life. Anybody? Anybody? All right, let's all stand. We're gonna pray a prayer. You five that stood. Even though you've already prayed, I want you to pray again. And the rest of us, we're going to join you. Say this to Jesus, because he's the only one who can save you, but you got to mean it. He'll hear you. He sees the sincerity of your heart. He's going to answer your prayer. Y'all ready? I said, y'all ready? Everybody ready? All right, say, Jesus, thank you that you love me, that you are calling me. Here I am. I turn from sin I turn to you, and I ask you, Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and be my Savior. Forgive me of all of my sins. I receive you right now. You are my Lord, and you are my Savior, and I thank you, and I praise you. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Now, seriously, you five that stood, the two over here and the three in the back, please. Kirby and Jessica standing right back there under that television. Please slip out of your seat and go with them right now for three minutes. They're going to pray with you. They're going to put a gift in your hand, and they're going to give you a 12-step spiritual, I'm going to call it instructions, amen, to help you in your faith walk. And let's give them a hand as they go. Come on. And people, I, I'm going to give you some homework. I want you to go home. I want you to read all of Deuteronomy chapter 8. But I want you to think of it, not a physical land. I want you to think of your spiritual land, of the kingdom of God. I want you to see God's heart for you. I want you to see his love for you, his desire to bless you. I want you to see that the reasons there are principles and statutes and laws ought to bless you. And there are reasons there are laws and regulations and a yellow stripe of morality. And that's also to bless you. Amen. Lord Jesus Please give unto them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of you as they study you through your word, Jesus. Lord, that is the surest revelation that we can ever have of you to see you in your word. And I thank you for it. Amen. God bless y'all.